All right. Well, I'm starting the streamer now. Um, I haven't gotten the questions, I mean, uh, the exam graded yet, but the solution or the answers are disclosed on the sep on the 19th. No, but it's on the on the day, you know, during the lab time. So the you know, the video was released, I think. Did I put a link into Moodle? I mean, uh, Canvas. No, did not. Okay. So I forgot to do that. But some of you were in the lab time, you know, so you guys knew the answer. So um, you can watch the video from yesterday, lab time, because you know it's it's almost the same almost the same test with only minor differences. Okay, but the minor differences will make the difference if someone is to copy the answer of one test to the other one. <laughs> <coughs> So anyway, so you can watch that and know the uh, what the correct answers are to all the questions. And meanwhile, we are going to move on and talk about the, con we'll continue to talk about the von Neumann architecture. So that's going to be the focus. We're continuing with whatever we left off you know, from last time. So one thing that some of you may want to do is to look up von Neumann. Or von Neumann, I was corrected you know, by a Deutsch speaking student that I did not pronounce the name correctly. It's Von Neumann, John Von Neumann. And uh, so he's the guy who, uh, who was responsible to make it possible for your cell phones to update its apps without you having to put on microscopes to rewire things. You know, spend like months and years to rewire things just to update one single app. So he's the flip-flop. Hmm? Is he like the flip-flop and stuff? Yep. But his idea, well, flip-flops existed before his time, but it was only used to store data. So the processing, the instructions to do the processing was done by hard wiring. Okay, let's hook up this register to that register, and that register to this input of this adder, and so on. So everything was hard wired, uh, mostly using plug-in plugs or you know, wire wrapping wires. Yep. So he didn't come up with the register itself. No, nope, he did not come up with a register, but he came up with an even uh, more interesting idea, which is okay. Let's not you know specify what the let's not specify the behavior of the computer using wires, and instead let's store instructions into the memory that is already there to store data. So that was his idea. It didn't sound like a big jump or big leap, but it made it possible for computers not to be updated by hard wiring, which also you know, which Basically today, you know, came to what we have now. Okay, you can update the firmware of just about anything, including a Tesla over the air. I consider a Tesla the largest, you know, mobile app. It is mobile, right? <laughs> Being mobile doesn't say anything about you carrying it or it carrying you. So a Tesla is mobile, okay? It's the biggest you know, mobile you know, device that you can ever have at this point. But that's going to be topped by autonomous coaches, buses, 18-wheelers, and so on. Okay? You know, and that's going to happen very soon. There are more reasons to automate buses than there are reasons to automate passenger cars. Why do you think that is the case? So they can always get their own stuff? That's one, but uh, think about it this way. If you do not automate passenger cars, what's going to happen to the sales of cars? Nothing, right? Yeah. Okay. If you automate passenger cars, you know, does it really, really make a big change in terms of sales of automobiles? It's actually going to negatively impact it if you think about it. Okay. Yeah. Because now you can share, like a few neighbors can now say, okay, oh, we can share the same vehicle as long as the schedule allows it, right? Because the car can come to you, doesn't you know? No one has to drive it to you. The car can come to you. But when you think about eighteen wheelers, when you think about you know all the commercial you know trucks and transportation, what do you think auto automation is going to bring to that particular industry? Allows it to work twenty four seven. Okay, go ahead. Allows it to work. Allows it to work twenty four seven. Okay. It's more sales because they can just afford more cars on the road, basically. And also, they don't have to pay people. Yeah. Okay, now initially the investment to get the automated system, automated system to go and to re retrofit the truck so they can be controlled by computers will be slightly expensive, okay? But in the long run, you know, the amount of money they can save by not having a professional driver in the truck is gonna save them a lot of money. 
which means there's, there are more reasons for industry to sh shift to automation when it comes to large commercial type of driving. Yep, go ahead. It's going to say around like 20% generally for any company. 20% mm -hmm. is the labor. Mm -hmm. And if that's eliminated, 20% is a huge deal, especially yep. for automation for like trucking industry. Yep, because you have to pay for the insurance, you have to pay for benefits, and people cannot operate 24-7. And when, they, when you try to push your know, truckers, your know, truck drivers, to drive more than they really should, accidents happen, and that's costly as well. Okay, so we will see you know, commercial trucks you know, pretty soon. Uber has been working on that for a while already, but Uber is uh, you know, suffering a little hit in terms of publicity and a few other things. Yep. Freight liners. Yeah. You mean like ships? No, no, no. no. Uh, the 18-wheelers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are actually making electric versions of those, uh, you know, tow, you know, those, uh, how do you call those things? The the first part of an 18-wheeler, the, the part that tows. Okay. Huh? The semi-truck? Yeah, so they're making uh, electric versions of those. Um, so both uh, Tesla and what is the company that actually makes those, you know, uh, and uh, those trucks. Which one is Peter Cummings. Cummings. I think Cummings is the other one. They make the engines. They make the engines, but they're making an electric version of that now. So we'll <coughs> see some interesting changes in the Funny in the future. Today, huh? uh, Ford just put a team together to mm -hmm. fight against Tesla. The team is called Team Edison. Team Edison. <laughs> so we have Edison versus Tesla, right? <laughs> Now, of course, we all know that you know, Edison is the fake. You know, he's the one who stole the ideas and turned it into commercial, turned into viable commercial viable, you know, concepts. So Ford probably chose the right name, fits them perfectly. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and Tesla is the one who you know, came up with all the ideas, but he did not commercialize or make any money out of those ideas. And that you know, if you took the uh, personality test. That's the difference between an INTP, who's Tesla, and INTJ, and that's Edison. One is goal-driven, the other one just kind of floats around and goes like, I wonder why, and then spend all day, all week, all year thinking about that problem. Once that problem is solved, move on to the next one. I wonder why, <laughs> but never really, you know, after objectives, like, I would like to. Yeah, there's, no, there's no such thing as I would like to with an INTP. All right. So getting fast forwarding back to our notes here, I put a few links here. Um, we talked about D flip flop and other, other basic memory devices already. I did not extend that note, so we are pretty much done with that. Um, I added this one here, which is a pretty short note here. Um, it talks about the you know, clock circuits. We'll talk about this today, it's really short. It won't take a whole lot of time. And then for the other modules, um, or other components of this module, we're gonna study but we're going to study the LogiSim library reference because it's already written there, and most of you know how to use LogiSim already. So you know, I'm just going to be leveraging on you know, what is already in that tool. And your homework assignment is called the Music Box. We'll talk about it today, um, so that we can stitch all the components together. Is that okay so far? Okay. So what we'll do is we can, we we'll take a look at the Music Box homework assignment first. And then we'll go back and talk about the other two slides, which, which are basically what you need to do your homework. <clears throat> this is your music box homework assignment. So here's the why. Okay, let me magnify this a little bit. This is a little bit too small. And this is why I do not really like um, the way D2L does things. I can't get rid of these panels. So I can't really make it. I can slide this a little bit, but it doesn't really change a whole lot. I suppose I, uh, it doesn't let me slide it sideways, so I can only make it taller, but not sideways. Uh, okay. Can put it up in a new document? As a new document? Yeah, like download it. Not easily. I mean, there are, there are ways to do it, but not easily. Like yeah. Or yep, that's the only way. <coughs> yep. Okay, but we can still do it like this. Um, so the why is the music box is the most basic form of automation, has existed for centuries if not more. Um, instead of plugging the pins to make sounds like a real uh, music box, the music box that we are doing is only going to send some zeros and ones to some kind of output pins. Okay? 
but it's going to do something that's sort of fun, not really, but sort of. Okay, it's something that you can actually see. Um, all right, so is everybody familiar with the actual <laughs> music box device? Is there anyone here who does not know what is a music box? Or the mechanism of a music box? It's like okay. It has like drums on it and it has like little pins and it turns, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So music box mechanism. And we'll take a look <coughs> at video. It's always fun to bring it up. I mean, this is really kind of cool. So this is a music box. Um, it's essentially, you know, a drum that rotates. You know, it's wound up, you know, using a, you know, whatever is on the left-hand side. This one may be motorized. You know, it looks like it's completely motorized. But it could be wound up too. It's hard to tell. And then you have all these pins that the little indentations <coughs> uh, in on the drum is plucking, and that's what's making the sound. Okay, looks pretty simple. Okay, but you can think about if you can think about this and actually equate to certain things that we have already talked about. Okay, it's either a plucking or not a plucking. It's zeros and ones for the most part. Okay, but the drum is not very smart, right? The drum it has a prefix in the program, and all it does is to keep rotating, keep you know, playing the same tune over and over and over again. So deep inside the processor, we have a drum just like this. It's not quite as dumb, it's not quite as you know, plain like this. You know, it has different drums, okay, so to speak. But each drum is still pretty simple. Okay, it just plays the sequence over and over again. So the question is, what is it plucking, okay, inside the processor? If there's a music box mechanism inside the processor, what is it plucking? So we'll answer those questions a little bit later on because we need to first talk about what is a mux multiplexer, what is a D mux or D multiplexer, and stuff like that, before we can talk about you know what these things are plucking. So for your homework assignment, is that okay? But can I stop this uh, demonstration? Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna take this out and go back to <coughs> here. So what we're doing, what we'll be doing, is a self-playing mechanism that replace some kind of content in memory. Um, in this case, we'll use ROM read-only memory so that the content does not reset, it doesn't go away when you cycle power. In LogiSim, when you load the file again, it is quote unquote the same thing as cycling power. <clears throat> All right, so the how is it has two main components, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so instead of talking about this part, let's talk about what it is supposed to do. So what it is supposed to do, it is supposed to display the letters CISP310, okay, there are seven letters all together, repetitively when tick is enabled in simulation mode. Do not light up segments that are not, okay, type, type bad you know, spelling here, are not a part of the digit. For testing purposes, choose a low tick frequency so you can actually see what is going on. You may also want to enable login so you can analyze the behavior of your design for debugging purposes. And we, I have also, also, I also have restrictions of what you can and cannot use. So these are the only components that you can use in this particular design. You can have one ROM, one register, one adder. It doesn't have to be your own adder. If you insist, you can use your own three-bit adder. Three bits are enough. Uh, you need to have one clock, one seven-segment display, and one button, one OR gate and you know, a splitter, and any number of constants, which is a great help here, and any number of wires. So those are the things in your box, okay? So think of this as a, as a little box that I give you with all the components in, okay? I'm giving you a huge spool of wires where you can cut into any you know, length that you want, any number of wires that you want, but the other components are limited, okay? So many of these are, there's only one, except for constants where you can have as many as you want. Is that okay? So what I want you to do, okay, is to utilize, okay, I'm gonna start up uh, Logisim because that's actually a central part of today's discussion. So what I want you to do is to use Logisim to make a music box and the key, the output of this is called a seven, seven segment display. This is a seven segment display. And you know, I know it's kind of faint, 
But you can see that it has kind of like an eight inside, right? So each one, each straight line is called a segment. The period is a segment as well here. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and that's why the name is called a seven segment display. The period is basically the eighth one, and then you also see that there are eight input pins. Okay, it may not be easy to see, well now you can see it, I think you can see that there are eight blue wires. So depending on which one gets a one, that particular segment will light up. So the question now is, okay, but which segment corresponds to which input pin? Well, that's why the library reference is going to be very helpful in this particular homework assignment. You go to the input output library, you look up a seven segment display, like that, and this is the wiring right there. So do you, can everybody see how the uh, ports or pins are connected to the ind individual segments? So that's, their, it, their, that's how they're wired up. So I want to use something like this to display CISP310 in sequence, and then go back to CISP310, CISP310, and so on. Is that okay? So that's the ultimate objective. That's basically you know, what I want you to do. But I don't want any delay. In other words, I don't want to see CISP310, wait for an, an entire cycle, and then go back to CIS, CISP310. I want it to be continuous. Okay, so when I look at the timing, it has to be CISP310, 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 with no pause between any two letters. And then the uh, period of each letter has to be constant. Is that okay? Sort of? Do you see how, your, how this is sort of like a, like a music box? Okay, except it's not plugging wires, it is now lighting up segments of LEDs. Yep. Will it display just one uh, single character at a time? Yep, it will display one single letter at a time. So it will display C and then I. You know, how you want to display the CISP is up to you. Um, there, You can look it up online and there are kind of like standards of how to do it. So if you look up seven segment display um, alpha numeric. <clears throat> and look for images. So here we have a pretty good display of how you know, letters and uh, digits are represented using the seven segment display. You can see, you know, C is easy, okay? You know, this is C, I, S, P, three, one, zero. Okay, so you can, you can just copy from here. Okay, you don't have to be creative and make your own you know, seven segment display. W and M look really weird. Sorry? W and M look really weird. Yeah, it's kind of a, you know, when, you, when you have seven segments, yeah, you, have you, you can only do so much. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what people used to do in the good old days. You know, calculators only have seven, seven segments, and sometimes when it does have to display letters, you know, it looks like that, yep. Mm -hmm. Pagers have a continuous scroll. Yes. Right, except your uh, your display only has one you know one character, so you're scrolling through that one character over and over again. Yep. Is that okay? Yeah. Yep. Is there a wire that connects the period, or is it? Uh, is that a wire to what? Because uh, there's a period in, in the seven Yes. So the wire that connects to the period is this one here. Nope, the, the period is not a part of the letters that we're displaying, so it should not be turned on at all. Okay, and there's also another uh, requirement that um, you, you don't want to leave any input pins unconnected. So when you read the homework assignment, it says, you know, right, okay, it says somewhere, make sure no input pin is, no input is left unconnected. So that is, imp that's important. All right. So now that we know this is what you're supposed to work on, let's take a look at the clock circuit uh, note here. We talked about a register already, and this is just an explanation of all the ports or all the pins of a register. So we talked about the D port, which is basically the input, the data input of a register, the clock, 
the enable, the reset, the queue, which is the output, and th those are the ports of a register. What if you find my description not really easy to understand and you want an alternative explanation of what a register is? Where, do, where should you go? Wikipedia? Well, I, can, I don't even have to go onto the internet. <laughs> the library reference of Logisim also has a pretty good description, but it is inside the memory library. So go to the memory library, and you can look up a register, and it would explain the behavior. It, look, it would explain all the pins, what each pin is doing, what does it mean, and so on. So are there any questions about where to find detailed information of the components that we are supposed to use? The reference has everything that we need to know. Okay? If you read this and you say, okay, but I don't quite get you know, what they're saying about blah, 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 let me know. Okay? So we can, I can add to this explanation, but this is where you need to go to start with your quote unquote studying. Is that okay? All right. Some of you will say, but I want to print this out. Okay? I don't want to you know, uh, read from my you know, device because you know, I want to do it. I want to do some studying on my tablet and this doesn't work on the, on the tablet. What should I do? Well, does it look like this is kind of uh, HTML to you? It is actually HTML. Okay? So the question now is, how do we get to the HTML documents so that you can use a regular browser to open it, print out your know, stuff, you know, and stuff like that. Okay, so I'll teach you how to do it. So you go to a command line. I'm not sure how to do it in Windows, but in Linux, this is how you can do it. In Windows, probably be something very similar, but not exactly the same. So I go to, uh, let me see if I have that already. Yep, I, I have that folder already. So I'm gonna remove the folder called Logisim. Okay, every JAR file, what does JAR stand for? Not as an English word, but in the context of an extension. It's a Java archive, okay? So when we are talking about archive, it is usually compressed, and also it may contain, contain multiple files. It's like a zip file, okay? A zip file is a, is, a, is a particular archive format. So in this case, it is the same. So when I say file, okay, this, you can only do this in, um, in Linux, but it tells you what kind of a file it is. A jar file is actually, interestingly, it's also just a zip file, okay? It's a special kind of zip file, but you can treat it as a regular zip file which means you can unzip it. Let's give it a try, right? Okay, so I'll just say unzip, logic sim, uh, generic, uh, generic dash 2.7.1.jar, and it will ask me, do I want to overwrite all of these files? I'll just say yes or all, and there we go. Now, this unzip you know, command may not be available in Windows, but it, it, it's dealing with the same format as the Windows zip format that, it can, that Windows can deal with um, natively. Except, when you look at, when you right click on a jar file, Windows will not say, oh, do you want to unzip this file? Because it is a uh, format that people usually do not unzip. So what do you do? You tell, exactly, you tell Windows, I know what I'm doing, I'm renaming the jar file as a zip file. <laughs> then you can right click and expand it, okay? It, can, it, it will unzip into its own folder, which is, I'll take a look later on. So, is that process okay? You have to, in Windows, you have to rename the file, change the extension from jar to zip, and then you can just unzip it, okay? You can change it back to jar when you need to run the file, okay? So if you want to rerun the file, that's fine. But you can also see right here, okay, let me go to a file exploring, uh, file, file manager here so we can actually take a look at the content more easily. Okay, so we're looking at downloads, there we go. And we're looking at logit sim. Sim. That's one. Where's the folder? It 
should be here somewhere. I think an SRC folder it went into a com. Okay, the SRC is one that's the source, and then the com is the other one. Okay. Um, probably some other folders too. Okay, I mean, yep, you're right. So it, I did not create a subfolder first, so that's why it's kind of messy right now. So SRC is one, it contains all the source files, and there's a resources file, and also the Java X, you know, those are the actual class files already compiled into Java bytecode. But the source is kind of interesting because you can actually see that this is an open source project, which also means if you do not like a particular way that you know, Logisim works, you can change it. But whatever you turn in, you have to assume that a plain vanilla version of Logisim will be able to process as well. Okay. okay. So what I'm really trying to do is to, okay, let's get out of this, is to find out where the HTML documents are located. So with, in Linux, it's relatively easy because I can just do a search for files that ends up with HTML. And they are all in doc en. Depending on your preference of language, you can see, okay, so it has Spanish, it's got Deutsch, it's got English, and so on. So you do have a few options here. So that means over here, we go to docs, D-O-C, right here. And then we have all of these you know, different languages. Uh, it has got Deutsch, German, English, Spanish. I think that's Portuguese, I'm guessing. That's Russian. So, you know, pick whichever one, you know, you want to use, okay? You know, you, you guys get options, got options here. There's no Chinese version, though. I feel discriminated. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Google Translate everything, right? Do a recursive Google Translate. <clears throat> All right. So when you go into EN, I'm just going to pick EN here. Go to HTML, and here's your index.html. That's where you start everything. So you go to library reference, you go to, it doesn't look as neat, okay, because it doesn't have a drop down box and stuff like that, but it does have everything. You go to memory library, you go to register, you click it, and now we have exactly the same document, but this time it's open inside a browser, which means you can just type control P, print it, right? Or if you own a particular website, you can upload it to your own website or your own your web presence, then you can use your mobile device to go there as well. Is that okay? I think this gives you a lot of you know options as far as you know what you can bring to the next exam because we know what the next exam is going to be about. So you might want to, to look at these documents and say, okay, I think this is going to be useful. I might want to kind of bookmark it at least so that I know I remember to print it for the next exam. Do we have any questions at this point? No questions? All right. If there are no questions, what we'll do is we'll continue with this note here. And with a register, uh, I'm going to use my version of the notes, you know, but you can read the other one. It, it's about the same. The D port or the D pin is a multi-bit input port so that the new content, so that new content can be specified. When you want to update a register, the D port, which is multi-bit, is where you need to present the new updated data. So, but when you present a new data, nothing is going to happen because it, it's waiting for two additional things to happen. It's waiting for the enable to become a one in the case of Logisim. So the enable pin, which has a label of EN in the schematic, is an enable pin. It's also known as a gate, okay? So this particular uh, D flip-flop is gated. So EN has to be a one, okay, in order for the register to be ready to get updated. So you can have the enable pin being a one and change your data input, but still nothing happens. It's because it is also clocked. So when you, when you look at the clock documentation uh, for the register, unless you change the clock edge direction, the default direction is a rising edge. In other words, the clock 
input has to experience a zero to one transition, and during that transition, the register gets updated. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> and then we have two other pins that are also useful, in, especially in this homework assignment. One is called reset. The reset pin is um, labeled zero in the schematic. It is also called clear you know, by the uh, logistic documentation. This port usually is active low, okay? Um, which means you know, when, it's, it, when they experience a low signal, it means you know, to reset. Um, in the case of Logistim, it is active high. Okay, so you might want to make a mental note about this. This is for the general type of register, but for the register in Logistim, it is active high, which means when the reset pin is high, it forces the content of the register all the way to zero. Every, all, every single bit is now forced to zero. It does not need to wait for enable, does not need to wait for clock transition, it just does it right away. Is that okay? Q is the output, so whatever the content of the register is storing, it is always going to output in the output pin Q. Okay. So the next section, are there any questions about how to use a register? Yep. Mm -hmm. So actually, did this magic with a register that she had on the uh, notes, and uh, so the reset it's supposed to be an active, low, active high, active high the whole time, right? For yep. it to work. So in the uh, notes here, in the schematic that I gave you guys, that's an active low type of a reset, but I also kind of mentioned how to change it to active high, you know, by just you know changing a few gates. Yep, but. Nothing, uh, nothing works better when it comes to trying to understand how these things work than experimentation. So what we'll do is going to be we'll pull a register. By default, it is 8-bit wide. It is a rising edge. So we'll just keep all the defaults in this case. Here's my input pin, multi-bit input pin for D. So we need 8 bits here to match the uh, number of bits in the device, like so. We have one bit of input for enable. So this one is going to enable right there. This is clock. Okay, Clock doesn't really have a label. Instead it looks like a little kind of like a inverted V symbol. That's your clock. Now for clock, I would suggest, you don't have to do it this way, but I would suggest that you use a clock uh, device here. This is called a clock device. It looks kind of like a pin except the inside looks like a, a square wave. So I would connect this one here because it's kind of cool about you know, what we can do with this later on. This is a zero or the reset or the clear pin, you know, however, however you want to call that. Another input pin connects to this. And then we have an output, 8-bit uh, output pin connected to the D port. So now we have everything in the register connected to some kind of external signal. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. So let's say we want to store something. If you want to store something, I'm going into simulation mode. So if, let's say we want to store 0011 and then 0101 into the register. And by the way, what would that look like as a hexadecimal number? Four, five, you got a five, right? Three, five, that, that is correct. Three, five is the hexadecimal um, representation of that particular A-bit pattern. This becomes really handy because Logisim displays the content of the register itself in hexadecimal here, and that's why you only see two digits. But nothing is happening right now because the enable is low, which means I can clock all day long and nothing is gonna happen because the enable is low. So, and also the, the, um, the clear pin is a low, which means we are not attempting to clear the content. Remember this one is active high and not active low. Um, this is the enable pin. I can turn on the enable pin, but nothing is happening to the outside. E nothing is happening to the register either because it has to experience a low to high transition on the clock pin in order for the content to be updated. So I will go ahead and give it a rising edge right now. So look at the output here. See how it's updated. But at this point, you know, with a steady state of the clock being high. I can now perform any changes here, and you can see nothing happens to 
the output pins. The state of the register is now quote unquote locked. Is that okay? Um, well, regardless of these pins, okay, if I put if I put a one into the clear or the reset pin, the content of the register will reset. So take a look at this. Okay. So do we have any questions about the behavior of a register in Logisim? It's a pretty good model of what a real register behaves in circuits. Okay, so it's it's a it's a good you know, realistic model. Do we have any questions about how it works by itself? No questions. Now, if you do have any questions, like you know, what if you know? The reset pin is high, and then we present something in the input, and then we say enable, and then we do a clock. Does it up update the output? If you have questions like that, the best way to find out what the answer is is to try it out. Okay, so you know, just like what I said. So if this is um, the reset pin is high, we have high as an enable, and now we have a transition from zero to one with the clock pin. Is the register going to update? The answer is it should not. Yep, and it did not update. On the other hand, if you take out the reset pin, so that it becomes zero, it's not attempting to reset or clear the content, now it updates. So are we doing okay so far with just the register by itself? Okay. Um, I know it is not politically correct, but for those of you who Understand firearms, you know the their you know equivalents to all of these things. Okay, the enable pin is like a safety, so it's either safety on or safety off. The the clock pin is the trigger, but this is going to be a single shot. It's not a full automatic, nor semi-automatic. Is that is that okay? I, I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable, but that's actually one analogy that works. It's difficult to find another analogy, and that's the whole point. <laughs> All right. Are we doing okay so far? All right. Okay, so what can we do with a register? Hmm. Let's change this one to include an adder, okay, which is the other part of the notes here. So when you switch back to my notes, the second part is to, uh, con is to talk about how to use a register in the context of synchronized operations. So, and then it presents a little example here. So we'll go ahead and implement this example, which you will find useful in your homework. So what we'll do is we're gonna include an adder. An adder is performing arithmetic operations, so you look under arithmetic, and you pull an adder from here. An adder has got five pins, or five ports. This one is carry in. This one is one of the numbers being added. This is the other number being added. This is carry out. And this is the actual output, which is the sum of the two input numbers. Okay. And remember, we do, we do not want to leave any input pins unconnected. So what we can do in this case is, hmm. I'm going to do something that is not exactly what your homework needs to do, but it is sort of related. So I'm going to take out this input pin here. We'll keep the output pin just like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the output pin of the register and feed it to both input pins of the adder, just like that. I take the output pin of the adder and I put it into the input pin of the register. And remember, I don't want to leave any input pins unconnected. We have one right here. The carry in is currently unconnected. So we'll use a constant. So we go to wiring. We go to constant. And sorry? OK, so we just, want, we, we just need a 0 in this case. OK, so we want to have no carry in, which is your K0. OK, so C in is basically a K0. All right. So now we have this whole thing looking like this. Sorry? C out if you want it. C out can be zero. 
yeah, or can be unconnected, sorry. So C out can be unconnected because it's an output pin. The reason why you do not want to leave any input pins unconnected is because um, a input pin, most input pins are in what we, what we call high impedance mode. Okay. Has anyone taken physics, ele ele uh, electrical stuff in physics? And how many people know what is impedance? Okay, what, what does it mean? It's, uh, well, it's a calculation of both capacitance and inductance. Okay, so how, what is the difference between high impedance versus low impedance? Do you don't remember? What is the symbol representing impedance? Z. Z, and what does it mean? I think impedance is more about like letting low frequency through or high frequency through or something. Have, it does have something to do with frequency, but it's basically resistance at a particular AC circuit yeah. of a particular AC uh, frequency. It's resistance for a capacitor or inductance, I think. That's what it stands for. Yep. But Z, when Z is high, it means it's high resistance. When Z is low, it means it's low resistance. Yeah. Okay. So when we say you know an input pin is, a, is high impedance, it means it doesn't take a lot of current to change its state. Okay. So if you think about it like, um, I don't know whether you guys have been on a bus before, public transportation, and especially one of those really old buses where in order to let the driver know that you want to take the next stop, you have to pull a string, and the string physically connects to a bell that is all the way to the front, <laughs> or in the case of a double-decker downstairs, you know, so that the driver can hear that bell ringing and go like, oh, okay, somebody wants to get off in the next stop. Okay, so if you need to pull really hard to actuate the signal to let the other side know about the change, it is low impedance. Okay, so these days, you know, when you look at you know, these the modern buses, it's just a little button, right? It's just, or it's maybe even, even, even it's just touch sensitive. That's low, that's high impedance, which means it doesn't take much to change the state. Is that okay? So if you leave a high impedance input unconnected, okay, so let me change the circuit. So this one is now unconnected. It basically means this thing is now susceptible to something that can change its state. It doesn't take much to change it. So what can possibly change the state of an input pin that is not being driven, not being you know, specified? The wiring itself, okay, on the circuit board, you know, there's at least a certain length of wire you know, connected to each input pin, and every wire is an antenna. Okay, it, it electromagnetic wave will induce a current on the wire. Okay, it may be very small, but it will induce something. It will induce an electrical current on that wire. So when the input is high impedance, it means it doesn't take much current to change its state which means the moment you turn on the microwave next to your computer and your computer has an input pin that is not connected, high impedance input pin that is not connected, that can flip its state from zero to one and back and forth, okay? Is that what we want in this case? If the carry in pin is flipping between zero and one, it does change what we are operating, right? It, change the, it changes the operation. So that's why we don't want to leave any high impedance input not connected. Because if you do not specify you know, what the state is supposed to be, something else will, such as your microwave oven. Or your cell phone. Okay, your cell phone actually does emit you know, a certain amount of electromagnetic wave, not enough to cause cancer. <laughs> Some people say that it's you know, really bad, but it's not quite that bad. But it does have interference coming out of it. Okay? Your microwave has far more interference coming out of that thing. My son, you know. This is, this is really evident because every time somebody uses the microwave at a 100% duty cycle in my house, my son would scream because he was on some kind of online game. <laughs> and then he would go like, oh, my internet just dropped. Look at the lag time, 3,000 milliseconds. And he's playing League and by the time you know, the microwave is done, he has died several times. <laughs> well, you cannot die several times in a League game like that, but but it does have an impact on Wi-Fi you know, connections. So that's why we do not want to leave any input pins unconnected. Output pins are OK, just not input pins. Are we doing OK so far with this explanation? Okay. 
All right. So what is what is this circuit going to do? Well, before we do anything, let's go ahead and figure out what this is going to do with this number you know, already here, and just say, okay, what happens when we clock this again? Now remember, this is rising edge sensitive, which means right now it's not going to do anything. So we have to drop it back to low again. But the next time I clock it, it's going to do something. But you want, I want to ask you, what is, it, what is it going to do? To be even more specific, what is the current output of the atom? That's the question. What, what is the atom? The, the atom is active the whole time. Okay. You cannot disable an adder. The, the, an adder doesn't have enable, it doesn't have a clock. It just says, give me some input, I'll give you the output. So right now, it does have some specific input. What is the output? OK. What do you think? It's doubling. OK, very good. So doubling is easy to see when we're dealing with binary numbers, because it is the same thing as left shift by 1. So we are expecting this wire to have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Does that make any sense? Because it is, we are adding that number to itself, so the output should be that. Logic Sim is very good at that. Okay? When you want to find out what is on a particular wire, what is the state of a wire, even if it is a multi-bit wire, you just click on it. And we see exactly that, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 which is 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, left shifted by 1. Does that make any sense? So given that the input of the register has this particular bit pattern, given that enable is already a 1, when I transition the clock from 0 to 1, what do we expect to appear here? The input should become the output, right? Okay, so let's clock. Oh, clock. There we go. Yep, so it does change. But this also, quote unquote, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's only changing by one uh, single uh, multiple of two because it only does it while it rises. So yes, that's exactly right. Okay, so that's a very good question because I think the source of your question is basically asking why is this not moving by itself, right? Because, you know, the, the the adder is now adding this particular number to itself. So this wire, the wire going into the input, is now you know left shifted one more time, which is one one zero one zero one zero zero. But how come the register is not changing? Well, because the rising edge is a one shot thing. Okay. Once the rising edge is done, the register is now quote unquote not paying attention to the input anymore. So the input can change to whatever it needs to or whatever. It, it can change in any way, but the register is not going to update because we are not experiencing a rising edge anymore. Anymore. Is that okay? So that's exactly why that is the case. Yep. Is this, uh, this going to lead into multiplication and division? Um, you can use <coughs> a clocked circuit to do multiplication or division, but it doesn't need to be like that. A division can be done by multiple adder and subtractors um, and not rely on the clock to clock things. If you want to save you know number of you know transistors and whatnot, I suppose you can use a clocked you know circuit to do it. But if you want the speed, it doesn't need to be clocked. All right. So are we doing okay so far with this stuff here? So if we clock it continuously, Eventually, this becomes zero, because every single time it clocks, it is is padding one zero to the right hand side and shifting everything to the left hand side. So eventually, we'll see all zeros, you know, shifting in, and there won't be anything left in that register. Is that okay? Making any sense? And to automate this, okay, to make this go by itself. You can go to simulation, make sure simulation is enabled, which is by default, but you can also go to click, uh, you can click uh, tick enabled, and this is a property that applies to a clock pin. In other words, this clock pin here, the pin that looks like a square wave, let you change the mode from uh, just single, single ticking 
using your, your using clicking the uh, the pin itself. If you enable tick, that means you know the system will tick it automatically, and the tick frequency is also controllable to a certain degree. So right now the tick frequency is four point one kilohertz, which means it's going to update. Uh, 4,100 times per second. That would be way too fast for us to see anything, right? I mean, the monitor cannot update that fast. <laughs> okay, even the gaming monitor only has a refresh rate of what? 100 times 100 hertz or so? 144, okay? This is way past that, right? So you can change it to something that's really slow, okay? You can change it to a quarter of a hertz, which means it takes four seconds to to have one transition. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do here. Okay, make it real slow and enable take. So now you can see, you know, every four seconds or so, the clock pin will change, and then after four seconds, it changes again, and then it will shift another zero in. Okay, not exactly very exciting. But all I'm doing here is to illustrate what you can do when you're doing your homework assignment. Is that okay? Yep. So that's going to dictate how quick the, the letter will be displayed. Uh, exactly. How fast you're rotating through CISP 310. So obviously don't use 4.1 kilohertz because you, you'll just, just see a blur. <laughs> all right. So one more time, you know, one more update, and we'll see all zeros. There we go, all zeros. So do we have any questions about this part? If you want to disable, just you'll go and check this check mark, and it will stop updating. So are we okay so far? Now for this particular experiment, if you say, "Oh, I want to see again," you can just go to the register and change the content of the register forcibly, manually, okay? So you can say, okay, 7F. So that's going to change the, the state of the register, you know, just by hand. So that makes it easier to control your experiments when you're debugging your design. Are we doing okay so far with just a register combined with an adder? All right, so the next component that we want to introduce is called a ROM, or read-only memory. So you can probably expect it to be in the memory section. And it's ROM, just like that. It's a slightly larger component because it, is, it has a few other components that we haven't really talked about. It has got three pins or three ports. The first one is called address. The second one is called select, which is also kind of enable. And the third one is called D, which is data. Okay, which is an output. So when you look at a ROM like this, okay, it's basically an array. It's basically a read-only array where what you put into the square brackets normally in C and C++ would be the address. What comes out as the result of indexing into the array is D. Is that okay? All right. So if I were to give this particular ROM a name, Okay, I'm just going to call this R, R for ROM. So that means, okay, let me use a mouse pad here for just the you know, kind of documentation on the side. So given this is the way we look at this, um, D is basically the same thing as A bracket, whoops, sorry, R bracket A. There we go. Is that working? Because I'm just trying to use notation that you should know already from your programming classes. You basically say that A, or whatever you present to port A, is the address. Okay, it controls which cell inside the ROM that we want to address. Whatever is addressing, the content of that cell is going to become the output D, assuming enable is a one. If enable is a zero, then it's not going to output anything, it's disabled. So is that okay so far? Okay. So we can play with ROM a little bit, or we can also read up the documentation on ROM. So you go back to the uh, library reference of Logisim, and this time we go to memory device or memory library, go to ROM, and it has the same kind of explanation. A 
selects which of the values are currently being accessed by the circuit. D is outputting the value at the currently selected address. And then cell, select, which is enable, is if you have just one round, one round module, ignore this input. You want to make it one all the time. If you have multiple ROM modules in parallel, you can use this input to enable or disable the entire ROM module based on whether the value is one or zero. Okay, so let's play with this one a little bit. We'll use a, an input pin to specify the address. And by the way, you, can, you also have full control over how wide you want the address uh, bit to be and also how wide you want the data bit to be. When you change the address, you're changing the number of locations in the ROM. In other words, if you change the address to only four bits, then you only have two to the power of four, which is 16 locations inside ROM. When you have eight as the address, that means you have two to the power of eight, which is 256 locations in the ROM. Is that okay? So for this demonstration, I don't need a whole lot, so we will switch it to four. This is the data width, which is basically saying, okay, what is the width of each location? A determines how many <coughs> locations. D determines how big is one location. Are there any questions about this part? So they are not linked in any way. So you can have four for data bit, for address bit, excuse me, only have 16 locations. But each location can have, like, all the way up to, let me see what is the maximum here, it can have up to 32 bits per location. Okay, I don't need that many locations. Uh, maybe I just need you know, seven for your seven segment display, right? Okay. And then the content is something that you can click. And right now we see here in the um, content editor, it allows you to specify what goes into the memory content of this particular ROM. In this case, it only gives you one single row because one row has 16 items and the entire ROM device only has 16 locations. Is that making any sense? Okay. So let's put some random content here. This zero here, which is all by itself, is indicating location zero. If I have more ROM locations, then you will see additional rows. But since, okay, let, let me just show you that one too. So if I change it to six bits for the uh, address, how many locations should we have now? What is two to the power of six? 64. And if each row can contain 16 locations, how many rows do we have now? 64 divided by, four, by six, 16 is four, okay? So let's switch back to that one. And now we do have four rows. So the number all the way to the left, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, those are the hexadecimal representation of the address of the leftmost cell on that row. Whew. Yeah, that's a long one. Is that okay? And you can, you can click on each one and change the content. So you can change, let's say, change this one to 1, 2. Uh, change this random place to, you know, 6F. But because we only have 7 bits, we cannot have 8 something. Because the 8 for the most significant uh, hexadecimal digit suggests that bit 8, it, bit 7, excuse me, bit 7 is a 1. But we don't have bit 7. Each location only has 7 bits, which means the most significant bit is only bit 6. So that means if I try to enter uh, 8F in this case, it doesn't like it. It becomes 0F because that, that bit got truncated. It rolled off of the left-hand side. 7F we can do, but not 8F. Okay. Um, so we'll put some locations here, you know, put some non-zero locations here, just so that we can demonstrate you know, how do we access that. Okay. There we go. Okay, so that, that should be enough. So we click close window, um, and we want to turn off simulation, turn it back on. Nope, doesn't get reflected here, darn it. It's supposed to show the content inside the ROM itself too. Um, 
Okay, save. Now, save means you want to save it to a file. It should not need to be saved to file. <coughs> but it's not showing it here. Oh, maybe. Reset simulation, that's it. There we go. So you need a reset simulation to have the content reflected inside the window of the ROM. All right, so we'll go ahead and connect these pins. So this pin is supposed to be six bit wide now because we want to match the width of port A. And this one is supposed to be seven bit wide. So we have this being seven bit wide here. And change it to seven, there we go. And select is by default um, a one, but this is an input pin again. So we should not leave it alone. We should always specify the state of an input pin. So we go back to constants and just put a one here to make sure that we always specify that this device is a one, is selected. The select pin is a one. All right, so is that okay so far? What happens, what should I do if I wanted to display 7F on this side? 7F, by the, by the way, in binary is... It's 111, that's 7. What is F? 1111. Okay, so if we want to select the location of 7F, the output out of D should be all ones. But what should I specify as the input? What should I tell A? if I want you know, to, to address the location 7F. And by the way, what, what is the location of that guy? In other words, what is the location of this guy? Hmm? It is location, this is location four, location five, location six, location seven. So we want to address location seven, which means the index to the array is supposed to be seven which also means you know, I should present the value of seven with the input pin. What does seven look like in binary? Three ones at the right least side. significant side. Yep, you're right, okay, so let's try that. We've got one, 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 and now we're addressing that pin. We're addressing that particular cell inside the, the raw module. So are we doing okay so far with this? This is all good? All right. What about the homework? So in the homework, the behavior of this particular homework assignment is, okay, the button is supposed to do something. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me find out where the button is described. Okay, so the button is used as a reset button. In other words, when the sequence is going, it displays CISP310, CISP. Okay, if I hit the reset button at any time, it has to go back and start displaying from C again. That's what the reset button is supposed to do. But if I don't hit the reset button, I want it to display CISP310, CISP310, but with no pulses between the letters. I do not want it to be CISP3100, CISP3100. Because that is easy to do. You can just, by, by changing the ROM to only have eight locations, it's going to cycle through those locations over and over again. But I don't want that, okay? I want it to be CISP310, and then go straight back to C again. So there's no pause, no, no digit or no letter, no character should take more time than other characters. So how do you make that happen? That's a question, okay? That is a question to you. Yep? Can you make logic and press the button? Hmm? Can you make logic and press the button? You cannot. <laughs> but since a, it's, a, it's a music box that needs to control itself, okay? You mess with the tick. The tick. You cannot mess with the tick. The tick is just you know, a tick. It's just a tick, 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 tick. So you can't. You cannot mess with the tick. Yep. Would it be like uh, skipping the last one by using 
turning off or enable. <coughs> that would be the enable is not the enable so much because if you turn off the en enable, then it will still take the clock still period. Turn. It will still it will display zero for two clock periods, which is not what you want. But you're close, okay? <laughs> so yeah, go ahead. The output of the ROM can go anywhere. So it can like go to the reset button or reset on. It can go to reset, it can go to the OR gate, it can go to it can be it can be a part of the input address, you know, it can go anywhere. So let me just but that's a very good point. Let me go back to Logisim and explain what the point it really is. Okay, so the point is this is just input, right? Um, you can take anything to be a part of the input. In other words, if you want to, you can turn the splitter into a merger and merge the button as a part of this input. Is it going to be useful? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But you're only allowed to use one single splitter, so you better use that splitter carefully. Is that making any sense? Okay. What about the output of a ROM? Where can it go? Well, it can go anywhere an input is. It can go to any input. So the output of the ROM can go back to its own address as an input. Why, you, why, why would you want to do that? I don't know. <laughs> it can even go to its own select. Why do you want to do that? I don't know, but it can be wired like that, okay? It can go to the pins of a seven segment display. Why do you want to do that? I think you know. <laughs> okay. Um, it can go to any pins of the register as well. Okay, that includes the D, but since you, get, you have used the splitter already as the output of the ROM, you can't really do it that way. But you can easily hook it up to the clock, you can hook it up to the reset, you can hook it up to the enable, because those are all quote unquote input pins. And you are allowed to use one extra OR gate for a reason, okay? <coughs> so the purpose of an OR gate is if any one of the input is a one, the <coughs> output is a one, okay? In, in, in a way, it is kind of like a merger, but not quite, okay? But it does have, it, it does give you a way to combine two signals into one using that logic function. So you have to ask yourself, when do I need to merge two inputs into one single one because the register only has one input that can serve that purpose, but I got two reasons to click that vein. So I, now I need a gate to do it. So that is the re that's the kind of reason, the kind of reasoning that I want you guys to go through is to think about, okay, what do I need to do? And what can I connect these things to in order to get it done? Are there any questions? Yep. Are uh, we only allowed to use one splitter? Yep. Okay. Why do you think? But you can use any number of constants, and the constants can have any width. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I just add something I want to do with two of them, but I guess I'll have to. I know it's going at it from the wrong <coughs> way. Mm, okay. Well, you can you can you can show me what you what you're working on, maybe during the lab time. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? It's like solving a puzzle. But that's exactly what it is. That's what, you know, that's what engineering is about. If you think about it in electrical engineering, what is it about? You have a purpose, right? You know, somebody is asking you and saying, I want you to design a box to do X, Y, and Z, right? <coughs> and you're not going to invent new parts. You're not going to go into quantum physics and go like, I would like to have a device that can do this. Nope, you go off the shelf, right? You go to the shelf, you go like, okay, what are the off the shelf parts that I can use? And then you say, okay, then how do I connect and utilize these parts to get that X, Y, Z done? That's engineering, which is what you're doing with this homework assignment. I give you a box with certain components, and then you have to figure out how to connect those components to get the job done. So you have to think about functionality. What pin can do what, okay? So after you understand what the homework assignment wants you to do, 
then you go back here and you ask what are these pins inside in, in to a register what are these pins to an adder what are these pins to a ROM and which one can do what so you're trying to kind of make connections between these things there are there's no restriction to the ROM module there are no restrictions to the width of the address bus and there's no limitation to the width of the data bus either so you can make it as wide as you want okay if you think that you need 32 individual pins as the output you can have it 32 bit wide okay not an issue if you think um, I need um, four locations per digit <coughs> displayed you can make the address bit you know width you know wider so you have more locations in ROM per character than you want to display I don't think you would need it but that's an option okay do we have any questions about that so there's a certain degree of certain uh, degree of freedom in this homework assignment but I also lock down some of the other parts like you, you only have one OR gate you only got one splitter you only got one ROM, one, you got one seven segment display, you got one single button, so the end user can reset the counter down, okay? So, any questions? Any questions about the components themselves, or questions about what it is supposed to do? So once again, if I don't do a single thing, I, I enable uh, simulation, it should display CISP310, CISP310. The moment I press a button, the button that is connected to this particular circuit, it needs to reset back to C. Okay, it will, re it will start from C and then CISP310. And the seven characters that are being displayed, the duration of each character on the seven segment display should be constant. I do not want any of those characters to be displayed like twice as long as the other ones. Because that would be pretty that would be pretty easy to do. Is that okay so far? You guys got more clues to get started with this one than all the uh, previous semesters. <laughs> And you got one week to work on it. I think that's quite a bit of time. So the first thing, okay, so here's my suggestion. When you're working on this homework assignment, I strongly suggest that you play with something like this, okay? And I can tell you the way that I connect the adder right here is not what you want in your homework. I suppose you can make it work too, but it's not going to be the most, the best way to do it. Got it. Let's see. Yeah, this won't work. Okay, I feel comfortable <laughs> now. Because I, at, at first I thought, you know, hey, if you hook it up this way, you can actually change the addressing of the, you can change the geometry of the ROM to make it work when you only have seven things to display. But then I thought about it again, and they go, nope, it, it, it won't work perpetually. It will work only through the first cycle, and then it, stop work, it will stop working. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I feel, I feel better now. <laughs> So this is not the right way to hook up, you know, the register and the and the adder. So you kind of have to figure out, you know, how you want to hook it up. I can always also tell you that um, you can probably do it in about the same way with only minor differences to what we have here. You might need one more constant, and then the wires will be connected slightly differently. Okay. Any questions? No questions? All right. Well, this homework assignment is kind of important because this becomes the microcode engine of a processor. Okay, so this, just to give you a um, uh, bigger picture, okay, of how this is utilized. So inside of your processor, so you would think that when you write a program in C, it gets compiled and it gets into binary code, and the binary code is executed by the processor. Yep, that is true. But when, you, when the processor executes a single instruction, 
that single instruction is broken down into even smaller steps, and those smaller steps are called microcode. Okay, and in order to step through the microcode, like click, 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 it's a mechanism that is what we are doing here. It's a little music box that goes through all the bit patterns, you know, to go through all the uh, steps to execute a single instruction. To give you a preview of what we'll be talking about on Thursday. Ah, wrong thing here. So what we'll be talking about on Thursday is the other components that we need to talk about before we can kind of talk about how your music box is going to be applied inside the processor. So we'll, talk, we'll study how RAM operates um, based on the documentation of Logisim library. Okay? RAM is different from ROM only in one minor way. What do you think that is? The O becomes an A. <laughs> But the actual words making up RAM and ROM are quite different. Yeah. ROM is read-only memory. RAM is random, random, random access, access memory. memory. Exactly. So random access doesn't quite tell you what can, you can do on top of what ROMs can do. But RAM can store content. You can actually dynamically change the content of RAM, but not ROM. Okay, so we'll study how RAM operates on Thursday. And we'll also study what is a MUX, a multiplexer and a DMUX, which is a demultiplexer, because those are very, very important components inside the processor. It gives you the ability to say, hey, I want this register to pay attention, and it connects to that part of the RAM, and blah, 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 blah. Okay? It, it helps you establish connections between components inside the processor. How many people have watched uh, Thomas? Thomas trained you when you were a younger person. Okay, so you know with railroad you got switches, right? Okay, multiplexers and demultiplexers are switches. So if you look at a processor as the island of Thomas train, <laughs> and you look at each train as a signal that has to go from one place to another place, and you look at each station as one thing that can per possibly do something like storing something, retrieving something, doing some calculations then the processor is really about which train should go where because that's what, the, what you need to do. So the, the, how do you call that person, the, the fat guy who's you know, in charge of the whole thing? Huh? The, no, 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 not the conductor. But in that show, there's a, there's a particular person fitting that role. I feel like they actually call him like the fat conductor or something. He's not the conductor because he's not on the train itself. He's like the engineer. <laughs> okay. The fat controller. Controller, not conductor. He's the controller. So Sir Topham Hat. That's that's it. That's his name. <laughs> so his job is to figure out the patterns. Okay. At what time do I need to switch this switch from here to here? so that this train can go from this station to that depot, and that train can go from that depot to this station, and so on and so forth. So what your microcode engine, or your music box is really doing, is automating the FAT controller. When the island is your processor, when each station performs a particular function, and each train is a signal going from one station to a depot or some other construct, then the fat controller is the conductor of the entire thing. He's basically saying that switch needs to go from A to B, this switch needs to go from you know, C back to A, so that this train can go from here to here, this train can go from here to here, and so on. That's how your processor operates. So that's kind of a broader picture you know, of what we are doing here. Um, I guess this analogy can work really well for the rest of this semester. So I might bring back some of my toys. You know, my kids used to play with the you know, Thomas train. We got Henry, we got Thomas, we got all the characters. I hope we haven't put, you know, given those away. <laughs> but that's basically what we are talking about. You know, by the time we talk about multiplexers and the, the multiplexers on Thursday, you will see how they resemble switches in the, in, in the sense of a real road deal you know, kind of switch. Right, so are we, are we good so far?
Don't you guys get the urge to watch those, you know, Thomas Crane, you know, episodes again? Especially with uh, George Collin uh, doing the narrative, uh, being the narrator. Those, those were particularly fun. Right. Because he was able to refrain from using any curse words. <laughs> we could watch it during lab. You can do that, exactly. We are, we're studying, we're studying how processes work. Thanks, John.